you're joining us online, great to see you digitally. Feel free to say hi in the comment section of this sermon, drop a note, share. Share it with friends and family, have a watch party, throw a like. If you have a prayer request, prayer need, don't be afraid to put it in the comments or get a hold of me personally through private message and I'll be happy to pass it on to the prayer chain. We believe in the power of prayer. So we'll pray with you and for you as needed. If you're a first-time visitor here or online, it really is good to see you. And it's my joy this morning to bring the word of the Lord to you. Psalm 46. Old Testament work, kind of right in the middle of the Bible, in fact. Psalm 146. We're going to pick it up at verse 1. And this is one of those chapters or texts you can just kind of keep it open before you the entire sermon. This will be the main text. We're going to refer to it often. Psalm 46, starting at verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Well, we're going to keep going, but I just had church. That was good. I just feel the Lord in this place today. I really hope that you're sensing where he's at and what he's doing. Don't, 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 don't miss the opportunity to connect with the Lord, to let him speak to you and touch you. Therefore, because of verse 1, we will not fear. Oh, so many sermons. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with surging, Skip down to verse 10. The whole psalm is good, but I want to look at verses 1 through 3 and verse 10. He says, speaking of the Lord, Be still and know that I am God. Now that's the verse that's on the bumper sticker, but read what comes next. I will be exalted among the nations, and I will be exalted in the earth. Keep your thumb on that page of the Bible. We're going to come back to that. Yesterday marked the 20th anniversary of September 11th, 2001. And since that fateful morning two decades ago now, our nation has experienced a series of calamities and impacting events. We've known costly wars, conflicts. We've lost thousands of servicemen and women. We've survived, I'll use that word deliberately, five presidential election cycles yielding four very different presidents, Bush, Obama, Trump, and now Biden. We've endured economic collapse on multiple occasions. We've witnessed fracture in our streets and in our culture. We've withstood a pandemic. We're still in the midst of it, as they say, along with accompanying lockdowns. Lord forbid they ever come back and beyond. However, I put forth this morning that the happenings of 9-11 remain fresh in the hearts of those who lived through that day. Now I realize as the years kind of wax and on and beyond that, that more and more people are now born after the happenings of 9-11. There's some in the sound of my voice that I talk about 9-11-2001 and you weren't even on the planet yet. How many though were alive on September 11th, 2001 and cognizant or aware of what's going on or what went on? To this day, I can tell you exactly where I was on that morning. I was often told as a boy that there are some moments so historic and so significant that they become forever etched into memory. For some, it's the assassination of John F. Kennedy Jr. For some, it's the moon landing, not Jr., JFK. For others, it's the moon landing. And I didn't really understand that, that premise or principle until the events of 9-11 firsthand. I was a 23-year-old Bible school student in Pensacola, Florida. And I had just started to date the prettiest girl on campus, and yes, I am referring to Misty when I say that. Just covering all of my bases. Misty, give us a little wave for maybe those who don't know you. That's her. I think of Pastor Bob Wise. He's a retired minister now, but he was our district pastor for a long time. I met him, and then he met us together. He looked at me, looked at her, and said, son, you must have lied to her. I'll leave it at that. Now, I will say that September 11th, 2001, genuinely began for so many as an ordinary morning in really every respect. In Florida, as always, it was beautiful, and the sun was shining. The student body, probably about a 1,000 young people, Misty, you were there, had assembled at 8 in the morning in the Bain Sanctuary on campus for our weekly chapel service, and it was a time of, of worship and prayer. 
And it was during this, this time of worship that I recognized something a bit odd kind of happening up on the stage amongst the professors and the administrators of the campus because in the middle of worship, they began to talk among themselves. They really weren't focusing on the Lord and the worship and so forth. They were, they were beginning to kind of chat back and forth. And I began to notice an, a bit of an unnerved expression on their faces, particularly as one of the uh, staff assistants continued to go out of the rear entrance of the sanctuary and coming back to whisper further into the ears of the leaders, uh, returning time and again to, to communicate with them. And finally, after some time, and I would venture to guess, it was apparently after the second plane hit the World Trade Center, uh, that one of the leaders, I believe it was the Bible school president offhand, uh, he informed the student body as to what had, had taken place. And I, I can tell you, it's amazing the things that jump off in your mind in terms of memories. I can still hear the panic-filled gasps of students in, in the student body who had loved ones in New York City and or worked in the World Trade Center. So even though we were far removed in Florida, this thing hit home to that room a couple of thousand miles away. And upon hearing the news of the Pentagon attacked, attack, my, my, my heart and mind personally went to a friend who lived in the D.C. area at that time. And I can recall in the midst of that worship time, now turned prayer meeting, because we believe that if something's going on, we should be praying for and about it. Um, I, I, I leaned over to Misty or chatted with her and said, is this the start of World War III? I mean, because you hear of, uh, of planes hitting uh, buildings, and again, maybe the first one was an accident, but the second one, you know that something is going on, then the Pentagon attack, then U-93, and there was kind of this unfolding series of events in the morning that no one really knew fully what was going on. In time, the student body was moved to a large room where there was a cable feed somehow established, um, and it was at that point that we began to to absorb the images, I mean, quite frankly, the footage of planes crashing and buildings collapsing. And I would say, for me at least, it still ranks as one of the most surreal moments in my life. It didn't feel real. Not only can I tell you where I was, but I can tell you what I felt. Hear me clearly when I say this, because I, I do not want there to be any, any miscommunication or, mis or misconstruing of what I'm saying. When I speak of emotion, I recognize that we often feel things that we are not to traffic in or succumb to. So when I say that I felt a certain way on 9-11-01, I'm not seeking to commend or to condone. I'm simply identifying what was going on in my own heart. I would say, like it or not, the first thing that I felt was fear. I, I can identify the presence of fear on 9-11, and I would put forth this morning who lived through the events of that day and didn't to some degree feel what I have in my notes as the icy grip of fear. It isn't every day that our nation is so strategically attacked with corresponding death and destruction. And though we are not to fear in the midst of crisis, the call to fear not often comes when there's every human reason to be afraid. So was I afraid a bit on 9-11? Yeah, to be quite honest. And if you were further along in the Lord than I was at that point, bless you in that. But I'm just telling you what I felt on that day. I would say, number two, there was a degree where I felt helpless. Rarely in my life have I felt so personally impotent and vulnerable in the face of circumstance because there was nothing that I could do in that moment to bring genuine relief or, or, or consoling to the people in the room that had loved ones in New York City. I could pray, and we did. I'm not downplaying or diminishing the place of prayer, but in terms of offering practical help to bring relief to the hurting, there was nothing that I could do. There was nothing that I could do as we watched people on the top floors of a building that was burning and about to collapse, and they wanted rescue, but there was nothing anyone could do for them. And many people jumped to their demise, and the images are still there. Frankly, I wouldn't look at them because they're so dark and so painful. There was nothing that I could do as I saw buildings begin to collapse. There was nothing in my human power that I could do except for watch, which was a very helpless feeling. Number three, I would say I felt a, uh, I felt a genuine disgust. I felt disgust at the figures who so strategically plotted and executed a heinous attack upon so many innocent people. Am I alone in any of these feelings or am I just, okay, just making sure. 
I felt disgust at the, at the imagery of people in foreign countries burning our flag and celebrating chanting death to America. And to be quite honest, I was revolted by my own feelings towards such people because as someone who knew the call to love my enemy and pray for them, I would have been happy to press the button and turn the whole country into a parking lot that day. I'm not condoning that feeling. I'm identifying the feeling so that I can recognize it and overcome it. But you have to be honest with what's going on in your heart. If you don't believe that, read the book of Psalms. Very emotional book. Shifting gears greatly, I would say, on the other hand, I felt a great respect and admiration on that day because I watched in amazement as brave police officers and firemen rushed into burning buildings to save as many as they could, many giving their lives. And even though I was personally helpless, being so far removed, there were so many that took the steps to do what they could with what they had to save as many as they could. And they changed lives. One of my favorite pieces of art came out of that, of that era. And I can only describe it to you. I don't have the image, but it's worth looking up. It was, it's a billboard. Just use your imagination of a billboard. And it has on it a, a police officer and a fireman and some nurses and doctors and construction workers. And in front of this billboard, you see Superman looking up and saying, wow. Because for a moment, and frankly just a moment, we saw what heroism looked like. You know, long before we wanted to abolish the police, we actually esteemed them. Food for thought. It's amazing how far things can go in a very short amount of time. I would say the final thing that I felt that morning, beyond the anxiety and the helplessness and the vulnerability and the revulsion and even the esteem, was faith. Hear me when I say this, that I was a very young believer on 9-11-2001. I was 23 years old. I'd been a Christian for about three years, maybe three and a half. I was young in terms of age, and I was young in terms of spiritual maturity. But despite the more negative emotions that I felt in that morning, I can tell you that there was an abiding faith in the Lord, in his good purpose, and that in the end, he would ultimately prevail and or triumph in the earth, even if it didn't seem possible in that hour. God is our refuge and our strength. In ever-present help in trouble, therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way, and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, he says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations, and I will be exalted in the earth. I've told you where I was, I told you what I felt. Let me share with you briefly. I would say a few life lessons that I learned that day that have stuck and that continue to be true. Number one, I would say the reality of evil. The happenings of September 11th, 01 evidenced the reality of evil in our midst. Our nation had and still embraces the idea of what's called moral relativism. If you don't know what that phrase is, you should look it up because our culture is overrun by it. Cultural rev moral relativism is, a, is the idea that good and evil and right and wrong, they're not objective, they're not absolute, but they are subjective and they shift person to person. If someone ever tells you, you live your truth, they're a moral relativist because there's no such thing as my truth or your truth. There is the truth in his name is Jesus Christ and what flows from his mouth and is inspired directly by him. But it's hard to deny the presence of evil and the operation of evil when you see terrorists hijack planes and take out thousands of people in a one fell swoop. If people can't call those kind of acts evil, will they call any kinds of acts evil? The Bible never downplays human evil or our capacity to do wicked things, individually and collectively. Don't turn there, but just absorb in the hearing the reading of the file, the, this next text by the Apostle Paul to the church at Rome. And he's alluding to so many Old Testament texts. They're all in my notes. Download them on Tuesday or Wednesday. There is no one righteous. You ready for what he says next? Not even one. To those in the sound of my voice, given to the idea that you're going to go to heaven because you're swell, no. Frankly, no. You're, you're wrong. You may sincerely believe that, but we can sincerely believe things that are sincerely wrong. 
There's no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned away, Paul said. They've together become worthless. There's no one who does good, not even one. In other words, we're so given to sin that it's just our inclination to do more and more wrong. He continues on characterizing humanity in general, that their throats are open graves and their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Don't believe that? Go on social media for a while. Look at how people talk to one another. With mouths full of cursing and bitterness, their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. In the way of peace, they do not know, Paul says, including with there is no fear of God before their eyes. Now that being said regarding the operation of evil in the world, Scripture also puts forth that there are spiritual forces behind that that play upon our inclinations and I would say exacerbate or make them even worse. Paul said, same author, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Hear me clearly when I say this. Are people like Al-Qaeda and the Taliban and beyond doing evil things and will they be held to account? Yes. But there are forces behind them that are also driving it. And that's why we are to look at the spiritual forces and be prayerful and responsive and still love our enemies. Because frankly, even the worst of us is just a pawn in a far greater chess game. To make this a little more practical, the problem in your life may not be your boss, but it might be the spiritual forces behind your boss that the enemy uses to trip you up. There's always spiritual forces at work. And I'm not saying you look for demons behind every, every issue in life, but don't downplay them either. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, Paul says, but against rulers and authorities and powers of this dark world and spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Don't you think there are spiritual forces still alive and well in our time? driving thing in an anti-Christ direction. Long before the anti-Christ surfaces, the spirit of the anti-Christ will be very much at work. And he has been for some time. So evil is a real thing. Learn that in some ways the hard way in 2001. Number two is the brevity of life. The happenings of that morning evidence dr drastically and graphically our own mortality and how short and frail this thing called life is. We do fancy ourselves, like it or not, rather invinci invincible and invulnerable most days, giving little thought to how frail we truly are. We pretend that life will continue on forever without much disturbance. Well, to put it as lovingly as I can, the 3,000 people who died on that morning never thought the night before that it would be their final, su their final sunset, their final meal, their final moment to kiss a wife, a husband, a child, and, be and beyond. I have in my notes how many left for work that morning, never to go home again. We're mortal. And that being said, it's, a, it's necessary for us to be prepared, not just through this life, but ultimately for the life to come. Book of James says, what is your life? I love this verse, and I read it often. You are a mist that appears for just a little while, and then it vanishes. We don't last long, gang. 70, 80, 90 years, it's not that long. And by the way, you're not promised 70, 80, or 90 years. The Bible says, teach us to number our days. The prayer of a psalmist, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And I put forth this morning quickly that in light of these truths that life is so short and we must be prepared for the life to come are the things that you're living for today worth Jesus Christ dying for. Maybe it's time we take a long, hard look at how we genuinely live. And we allow the Spirit of God to search us and to know our ways and to begin to put his finger on things that may need to go and lead us into other things that are life-giving, that are honoring to him, so that he can flow into and through you in far greater degrees. I shared this quote recently, but it's worth listening to. When it comes your time to die, be sure that it's all you have to do. Finally, I would say before I really shift gears with the final 10 minutes that I have, that that morning reminded me of the need for the Church of Jesus Christ to play its role. Beginnings of 9-11, or sorry, the happenings of 9-11 evidence the need for the ministry of the Church of Jesus Christ. In one moment that rocked this nation to its core, countless men and women were suddenly made aware 
of the reality of evil, the frailty of life, and they begin consumed with questions about the life to come. Do you realize that the Sunday following 9-11, September 16th, still ranks as probably the most populated Sunday morning ever in terms of churches? They hear me clearly. It didn't last long. But there was a moment where the Church of Christ had a window to share, to point, to witness, to evidence something about Jesus that this world so desperately needs. This isn't a club. This isn't about just you coming, singing a few songs, and going home so you can live better. This really is life and death material that we have. You carry the gospel that can change life and eternity for someone, as do I. But so often when moments of opportunity come, the church of Jesus Christ finds itself embroiled in things that frankly don't matter. At the end of service, I'm going to give you a little bit of housekeeping and house cleaning. Because we're going to talk about a couple of things briefly. Because we can't get sidetracked from the mission, which is to reach those who don't know Jesus and to disciple them in kind. We are the body of Christ, Paul says. And each one of us is a part of it. Jesus is the head, but we play roles. He works through us. You may be the hand, you may be the proverbial foot, you may be the mouth, you may be the beating heart. I don't know. I can't tell you definitively what your role always is, but I can tell you who can. And you have a place. It amazes me that so so many people don't see any need for the church of Jesus Christ anymore. And I put forth, maybe that's on us because we haven't played our role all that well historically just through the happenings of our time. Jesus said the following. I'm going to take my time. If I'm late, that's fine. If you have to go, go. As someone said this morning, the Apostle Paul preached a sermon, person in a window fell out. Because he'd been preaching for so long through the night. Paul, the kid died. Paul went outside, raised him from the dead, and then went right back to preaching. We can give Jesus 30 minutes of our undivided attention. Jesus said the following. The beginning of his ministry. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. To set free the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Rough paraphrase, to proclaim the time and the age of God's grace has come. Fun fact for you, his mission is ours. We, as the church, individually and collectively, we are the continuation of that very mission. If you say, Pastor, I don't know what I'm called to do or be, that's it. Start there. And as you begin to move, he'll begin to steer and lead you into more specificity. God has an easier time steering a car that's moving versus one that's parked. The message still changes lives that God so loved the world that he gave his best, his one and only son, that whoever believes in him. And I take that whoever seriously. I don't care who you are. Rich, poor, young, old, pretty, not. Don't matter. There's room at the cross for someone just like you. Before I shift gears and move to a close, that's not a pastoral lie. I put forth that the police officers and the firemen who ran into the building that morning to save as many as they could, even at the risk of their own lives, serves as a fitting picture of the church of Jesus Christ. That's supposed to be us in a spiritual sense. Because as the ship is sinking, maybe put the fiddle down and start manning a lifeboat. And if the church isn't going to do that now, in the United States, all eyes this way, I don't know if it's ever going to. I say that as a huge fan of the local church, someone who has committed his life to ministry and serving and trying to upbuild. But if we can't get our act together now as things are just so weird out there, come on, be honest, are things weird out there or is it just me? Well, guess what God's response is to that? Christ in you. So you can watch Fox News or CNN all day. You can debate. You can go online. You can put the tinfoil hat on or off as you please. But we should be a transcendent people who speak truth in love and who recognize that maybe we've been put into the kingdom for such a time as this. You're not here by accident. 
frankly to each of us, including me. You ready? Get to work. Paul said, Jesus is the one that we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. In other words, I'm giving every facet of my being to the mission of reaching as many and helping as many as I can in Christ. He says, to this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy he so powerfully works in me. I don't say this to condemn because I'm speaking to myself when I say this. This is more of just like pastor's musings. If we were to meet someone like an Apostle Paul, would he even recognize us in terms of like partners in the mission? This guy was so devoted. Now, I'm not saying be a weirdo, quit your job, become a deadbeat father or mother and not work and then just go and preach all day. Saying in the course of your life and living, God can work mightily through you. The people that you rub shoulders with, the, the relationships that you have. Speak Jesus, radiate him into the earth and watch what he can do. I believe and I will die believing that the church's greatest hour is always ahead. And I pray that I live long enough to see that. I would say that the lessons of 2001, the feelings thereof and beyond, they still have application in 2021. And I say this as I close, this world is still full of the operation of evil, spiritually and in terms of humans. We do well still to recognize the reality of our own mortality, the brevity of life, and the need for believers to play the role of being a believer and a witness. And I end with a personal note that much like in 2001, I find myself a bit glued to a TV screen following the happenings of the world, particularly in Afghanistan. Today we find ourselves at the end of a prolonged war that was triggered by the events of 9-11-2001 and the happenings of our time, I would say, are equally historic and in some ways almost as tragic. And though I am careful in the consumption of news because too much can be toxic, so take note of that, the following quotation by a theologian and writer from the past century or two, it stays with me. Hear the following, the man who was content to sit ignorantly by his own fireside wrapped up in his own private affairs and has no public eye for what's going on in the church and the world is a miserable patriot in a poor style of Christian. Next to our Bibles and our own hearts, God would have us study our own times. I would put forth that many of the feelings that I felt on 9-11, can I be honest, I felt a resurgence of them lately. Once again, when speaking of emotion, I am not condoning, I am not commending, I'm simply saying and identifying so that these things might be overcome in the Lord. I would be lying if I told you that I have not once again felt the icy cold touch of fear. I will not linger long here, but I will say the situation in Afghanistan in 2021 feels eerily familiar to the world prior to September 11, 2001. It's a Lord forbid statement, but we may be done with the war on terror, but is the war on terror done with us? To a degree, I felt impotent in recent days. I felt, I have in my notes, I felt powerless watching figures drop off of airplanes to their deaths. I know this is harsh, this, this isn't fun material, but a lot of the Bible isn't either. I felt powerless watching mothers and fathers hand their, hand their kids over a wall to a soldier, maybe in the hope that they would have a better life. And I felt powerless as the nation of Afghanistan once again yields to terrorists. By the way, as we celebrated or recognized 20 years yesterday since 9-11, the Taliban established their government. Give some, give some thought to that. I find myself disgusted at times. I'm repulsed by the resurgence of such figures who are religious fanatics in all the worst ways. People who would subjugate women by force and force marriages upon stolen women and kids. I'm repulsed by our own government at times. I say this as a citizen, but I think it is... I feel repulsed by a government that would so fecklessly abandon and strand American citizens and allies, leaving 80 plus billion dollars behind in armaments, 
which will most certainly be used against our allies or ourselves at some point. That is not a pro-Trump, anti-Trump, pro-Biden, anti-Biden thing. I think it all stinks. History is the unbroken record of the failure of human government, and we are seeing that in real time. And I'm repulsed that a botched evacuation from one war may well trigger the next. However, I find myself filled with admiration for the truly heroic. I think of the many who gave their lives in Afghanistan over the last 20 years. I think of those who sacrificed not only life but limb. I think of those who so dutifully served and did come back home, but now they face the horrors of living after and through a war. Most recently, the 13 who died, who were killed in a brutal terrorist attack. The world's not worthy of such people who are so willing to go into danger to serve. Greater love has no man than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. They stand as shining examples of what we should look like. But beyond the fear and the helplessness and the disgust and even the admiration, there's an abiding place of faith that's rising to meet the occasion. The faith that I knew in 01, that faith in the Lord has power and in his inevitable triumph in the earth, it hasn't waned. It has intensified. And once again, for the final time this morning, I declare the following as something I am standing on with every fiber of my being to the best that I can in the Lord. God is our refuge and our strength. Penned 3,000 years ago, he's still an ever-present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. I am choosing. I am not living in fear. I am not. And I'm calling you to do the same. The earth gives way, the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, the waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. I am convinced of verse 10 in the call of the Lord to be still, and to know that I am God. And he has promised, I will be exalted among the nations, and I will be exalted in the earth. I can't tell you what tomorrow holds, but as the old song or saying goes, I can tell you who holds tomorrow, and I'm looking to him. We're going to close in a word of prayer. And then I have a few things that I want to share. Father, we thank you for this time together. And I recognize that, God, this is not an easy message. And frankly, it's not even a normal message with, with a verse and a series of points. It's more just a study of my own heart and where I've been in the hopes that maybe it would resonate with others as we all process through the days in which we live. Lord, our, our hearts are just oceans of emotion, and not all of them are great. We confess that freely. So often we feel things that are amiss. But in the midst of the chaos and the crazy, we look to you, and we trust you. We choose not to fear. We choose to operate in a spirit of faith. And God, I pray that you would deploy us to be the servants and the witnesses and the sons and daughters of the king that you have called us to be in this age. Because God's night's, night is coming when no one can work. Let us work the works of the one who has called us while it is day, while there's time. And Father, I'll end with this. Even so, come quickly. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. This is a crazy world so in need of the King. Help us to be ready for that day and watchful. So we go our separate ways in the moments ahead. God, I pray your blessing and keeping power. Let your grace and peace be with each of us, the families that we represent, those who are away, those who are online. Glorify yourself in the name of Jesus Christ. Everyone says, amen. 